All right, so for day one of this class, we are going to focus on uh, talking about adding, uh, working with a database for our project. And as I said, in part two, we're going to use PouchDB, which is a flat database, which is a NoSQL type of database, which is basically JSON, which is what we talked about last month. So we had that couple days activity, or one day, one day activity on JSON, and now we're going to focus more on how that works with our project. So the first thing let's do is open up our web browser, and let's go visit pouchdb.com. We're going to look a little bit at the specification of this thing, and then we're actually going to do it. But pouchdb.com is, uh, is the website where you can RTFM. Remember that acronym, RTFM? Read the funky manual. This is where the whole manual is at. This is where we read about how it all works, examples, documentation, and such. So PouchDB is an open source project. You can contribute to it. You can, uh, you can get involved and help the project improve. I have worked a little bit, actually contributed very little, but I've, I've worked a little bit on this project to kind of fine-tune here, fine here and things for educational purposes. And the people behind it seem pretty cool and, and open to all of that collaboration to make this better. And it's currently on version 5.31. So basically, this is the database that syncs. It's an open source JavaScript database inspired by Apache CouchDB that is designed to run well within the browser. So this doesn't need any sort of back end, really. It doesn't need a database. It doesn't need an intermediary like PHP. Classically, we might use MySQL, which needs PHP to interface with it, basically. Or there's other databases out there, you know, Oracle and uh, Access and FoxPro, I guess. All of those databases, but this new modern style of database based on JavaScript, it's not based on the classic structured query language, SQL, so it's a NoSQL database. Uh, it's all based on uh, flat database, meaning, as we saw with JSON, it's key value pairs, basically. Uh, user equals John. Uh, username equals J10. Password equals XYZ. So it's just key value pairs, basically. And it runs in the browser. So if this were a web app, then whatever browser the person uses to visit the, the, the website at Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, Opera, whatever, Safari, the data gets saved in the date in 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 the web browser itself, somewhere in the bowels of the web browser, somewhere in a folder, uh, your database is saved in your browser. For us as an app, well, it's we're we're running technically a web view. Our our apps are hybrid in that they're websites that are running in a wrapper of a native uh, container in your app, in your device, whatever it may be, iPhone. Android, Windows Phone, whatever, and it still this still all works. It saves the database in the app itself on your device, and basically this the sky's the limit of amount of space that it can store. It was created to help web developers build apps that work well offline as they do online, so it can also synchronize in the cloud. Enables apps to store data locally while offline, then synchronize with a CouchDB and compatible servers when the app is back online, keeping the user's data in sync no matter where they next log in. So we're going to work with it offline because we would need the infrastructure, we would need some sort of server infrastructure to save our data to. If we, get, if we buy, for example, a GoDaddy server, an Amazon server account, you know, Bluehost, whatever, if we have a little server in the closet, we would need some sort of server structure. And then we would synchronize. We would be able to synchronize our data to that server and have that persistence. Question. Compatible servers. I've been trying to research that, and I'm not sure that mine is a compatible server. Yeah. If your server can run, for example, CouchDB, the CouchDB package, it's compatible. When when they say here compatible servers, that that's I, I that should they should name that a little bit better in that, you know what is your capable what is your server capable of running? It's it highly favors CouchDB, but it can favor other types of uh, packages. 
I would like to know more about research that affected it because I came up with food dinner. We'll be able to find it somewhere in here in the documentation, and we will we will touch on that. Yes. Yeah, pretty much all of them have a version of it. When I was developing this course a, a few years ago and trying to figure out the best way to do this database, oftentimes I would see that it would be having a whole cloud infrastructure which is that overhead that I would have to ask everyone, okay, let's go, let's pull out our credit cards and let's go buy some Amazon storage. Well, that's too much of an investment. So there's a lot of databases that uh, follow this paradigm. Off the top of my head, I don't have any, but if we go look up the uh, Wikipedia article on NoSQL databases, we will uh, get a variety of, of, of results. And I think we did that previously. We went over to Wikipedia, didn't we? And we looked up, we looked that up and we got a whole list of types of databases like this. They've all got pros and cons. Everyone thinks they can do it the right way. They're all right, they're all wrong. It just depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If your project works the way it's supposed to, it was the right solution. <coughs> For us, I felt this one was very good because it's based on JavaScript. It's based on things that we've learned. It's based on JSON. It's based on this paradigm of, of, of NoSQL. And it's got the added ability that it synchronizes online to very quick preview of it here. var db equals new pouch db with db name. So creating a variable. We're going to create a, a variable which you can call anything, but oftentimes the example is db. Our database is a variable called db, and we're creating a new uh, object of uh, pouch db with a specific internal name, db name. We want to add something to the database. We've got the object db, we've got the method put, db.put, with then a bunch of options. We usually have a lot of options. For example, here, and this should look a little familiar when we talked about JSON, key value pairs, something colon something comma, something colon something comma, as many of these fields as we want, basically. And so this is a field ID, and it's a person's email. It's a name. David. It's an age. 69. It can hold strings. It can hold uh, numbers, booleans, and so forth. We'll see that we have a variety of uh, methods built in. Changes, for example. If, uh, if this, is, this, this is basically to detect, has there been a change to the database? So this right here looks like the sort of on click that we've seen, the event handler that we've seen. When there's a button on the screen and we <coughs> click it, we would have something like, you know, jQuery.onClick. And when we click a button, it does something. Well, there's a method here built into CouchDB, a method, um, an event of change when there's a change do something and here is just a console log output that there were changes and then there's a built-in method of replicating the data off somewhere to very simply here a server which of course is very 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 simple but the concept is there's the ability to replicate the data off to a server yes plus uh, what is the task for the ID for Okay, we're going to see that we can create fields, basically, of any name, but the one required one is underscore ID. There has to be one unique key to identify the data in your database. So I, I think there's a specific name when you deal with classic you know, MySQL, if you guys remember. What's the name of the key that is like the, the one that you have to have? The primary key. So here in Pouch, you have to have underscore ID, and it is unique. No other field in your whole database can be named the same thing. That's how we can keep track of all of this data in all of our database. In this case, it would make sense. Oftentimes, let's say this is data for a social network. Oftentimes, there's one unique email that identifies one user in the world. No one can have that same email. It'll say, names already taken, or, or emails already taken, or it'll say, uh, is this you? Log in. 
So we have to have one unique ID. Everything else can be arbitrary, anything we make up. And then it goes on to say it's cross-browser, lightweight. It's just a JavaScript library. It's a JavaScript file that we add to our project, and that's it. Then we have the ability to do all this stuff. The four basic things that we can do of a database. Create a database, add data to the database, delete data from the database, update data to the database, delete the database. And this guy right here, Nolan Lawson, he's one of the big names in... in in PouchDB, he's always around on Twitter and on GitHub and in the forums and such answering questions. One of the people that works on the project. I've, I've communicated with him and he's helped me out with some stuff and I've also communicated with them to kind of make it more user-friendly here and there for educational purposes. So it is a collaborative open source project with the benefits of that. And if you'd like to contribute and look up issues and all of that, there's all of the way to get in contact. Let's go look at the guides. Click at the top, Guides. There's various chapters here all about um, you know, frequently asked questions with some examples and such. We're not going to read it all, but just kind of skip around. JavaScript implementation of CouchDB. Uh, what is CouchDB? It's a NoSQL database created in 2005, um, etc. Let's see, I wanted to jump into an example, setting up CouchDB. So just looking at it quickly, setting up CouchDB again. We'll do this together in a moment, but I just want to do a quick overview of the documentation. We have explanation, we have examples. Um, here it's talking about setting up the Couch server, and then you'll actually have a server where you can save your data to. We're not really going to do that. Um, what we'll be looking at is PouchDB, and basically to add it to your project, it's a, it's a script declaration here, as we've seen before. Like we've done with adding jQuery or jQuery Mobile, we just point it to our library. I've, I'm going to provide you the file, but we can, we can connect to it online also. I want it in our local project so that, it's, you know, so that I'm not reliant on an online connection and then it doesn't work. So I'm going to give you that, Bower NPM, all of that. Don't worry about that. Oh, we have the, the CDN right here. If you want to not download the file and have it in your project, they say, okay, copy and paste this into your project, and we'll connect to it. You'll connect to it on the online version. Remember, the downfalls of that is if you have no internet connection, then your database doesn't work. Well, I don't need an internet connection for that at the moment, so in my case, I wouldn't want to do that. All of this other stuff, working with databases. Again, we've seen here the basic, the very first command we'll see is we need to create the database variable, the object in JavaScript. We'll do that in a moment. Notice the structure. We can call the database anything we want internally. The user never sees that. Database called kittens. Sure. And look at the documentation, very detailed and such. But what if we have a database on our on our own server? Well, here's a way to connect to it. Same exact syntax. We do need to feed it in the, the server online and such, and then we connect. Um, get info. Notice, I'm showing these examples because notice the, uh, the syntax again. We're going to basically over and over and over do something like db dot something whatever the variable that we made early on we keep we keep using that object to then use methods upon the object here there's a built-in method this is I mean built-in built into pouch db many of these methods make sense only to pouch db they're not standard JavaScript they're not standard jQuery they're methods that make sense in pouch db get the, basically get the info of the database, then display it to the console. That seems easy. And then it'll output JSON formatted content. In the console, it'll say something like this. And why do we know off the top of our heads, why is that JSON? Curly braces. The curly braces, it's enclosed in the, in the curly braces. That's a big giveaway that it's JSON. And then we have key value pairs doc count colon zero 
So that's quoted just like we saw previously when we made our own JSON project. The particular field, you can think of the whole thing as a, you know, as, as the database, the whole thing's a database, and in this particular field here, doc count, there are zero documents in our database. Uh, this is our first update. This is our, our first version of the database. There hasn't been any updates yet. We're going to get a sequential update sequence being populated here. Yes? So is this an output of pouch, or is this something that we would create? This is the output of pouch. Of pouch. pouch is going to feed, is going to spit that out after we did up here, uh, console log. That's what couch gives us. The pouch gives us. And so it's telling us we haven't updated the database yet, and here's the database saying. So basic database info. Uh, it shows that the remote one may give you more stuff because it's that's a little more complicated. Uh, debugging it. We'll be able to debug it, yes. So basically, they're just showing you how to debug it in a sense. Because you can count the outlook to see if it works. In this example here, it's just a quick proof of concept. That is works. the basic basics of it working? How it might not have worked is, well, I might have typed you know, up here vat instead of var. Right. Then it doesn't work. And then I might have also typed other things wrong. And this is just, yeah, it's working. This is basic. It works. Cool. Nothing that special. And this is new, actually. I need to look into this myself. But it looks like we've got a little um, extension to browser database a little nicer. The built-in debugging tools of the browser are fine, but it looks like they've now made a little extension to browser database even nicer. Blah, 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 all of that. You can read that on your own, deleting your database, and so forth, working with documents. OK, let's take a quick look there. They're going to use the idiom of document over and over. And it has a different name in different databases. But in, in, in Pouch, in this style of database, they call it documents. PouchDB is a NoSQL database, meaning that you store unstructured documents rather than explicitly specifying a schema with rows, tables, and all that. And a document looks like this. Again, JSON output. We need the required ID that we'll see. Notice all of this is pretty much in quotes. Except for that, why? It's a number. The type of uh, the type of data here is a number. It's a it's the number three. It's not the the string three, which is technically different as we've seen. But we've got key value pairs. There's the colon. There's the comma all the way till the last item. No comma. No comma. And we can have uppercase, lowercase, etc. ID mittens, there's only one thing in the whole database called mittens. Nothing else can be called mittens. Maybe a user visible name of that document is mittens. Occupation, it's a kitten. Its age is three. And then it's hobbies. Its hobbies here is an array. It's more items stored into the one field. You can kind of think of these as fields. The ID field, the name field, the age field. The hobbies field has multiple further objects in that in that uh, value because it's key value pairs. Playing with ball of yarn, comma, chasing laser pointers, comma, looking hella cute. And so that's one document. That's one record in the database. If I'm, uh, if, I'm collect if I'm amassing a database of cats, kittens, and then I have another one, which I will then replace with a brand new ID, a brand new name, it's still a kitten, it's ages four, or two, and then other hobbies. So this is like one record in the database, one document. And here it shows, okay, tables have no real equivalent, but rows would be documents, columns would be fields, the primary key would be the primary key, which, is, which has to be underscore ID. In an index is a view. Storing it, well, this is all just being saved in a variable. That whole thing in one variable, and then we just say put it into the database. So we can package all of that into a variable, a dynamic object, a variable, and then put it into the database simply with db.put. We don't have to, by default, deal with, you know, revision, conflicts, 
and other sorts of things like that, although we have that full control, but simply putting it into the database with an appropriate ID just works. And the result will be okay. Oh, well, the opposite, taking it out of the database. Putting it into the database, getting it out of the database. Which database? The DB database. Get. Get what? A thing in the database called mittens. Well, there's two things right now called mittens. Mittens and mittens. But get is going to rely on getting it by its ID. So the one unique field in the database, that's how we're going to get data out of the database. You know, get data out of it to read it, to edit it, to display it, um, update it, etc. We're getting something from the database called mittens. Then after that, with the data we got out of the database, display it. And then it's the data again, with a couple of extra, with an extra field here underscore red, revisions. Everything we add to the database is going to have a unique string to identify it and separate it from other versions of itself because we might have uh, added this to the database and the cat uh, was three years old this year. Well, it's going to be four years old next year. We have to update the database. We have to then change the age field to four and therefore it needs a new revision, and we'll see this is rather automatic. So we get 2 dash whatever. We can update the data, no problem. Internally for us, we're going to see behind the scenes about revision conflicts and all of that stuff. But for the user, they're not going to see any of this. It's just going to work when you say update for save. It just does it. We're going to have to deal with that and take care of it as developers, of course, because we, we have to. We're, we're designing it and setting it all up. Yes. Why does it just simply overwrite the data that's It's just when this was being invented and it's based on couch, when this was invented in 05, this is the way they wanted to do it because they want to deal with collisions of data. They, you don't, they, they don't want, for example, that this data accidentally erase old data without a little bit of a safeguard with you explicitly saying this is new version of the data because Conceivably, I could accidentally change any of this without wanting to, and I lost the data. So this revision field here is in place there to help us to, uh, you know, prevent that issue, basically. And it goes on to talk about what's the rev and all of that, and we'll see how we do it ourselves, how, uh, how to actually do it, but, you know, we, we could get errors and we'll get output that says, document update conflict. Again, we're going to rely on the console a lot. Of course, we're debugging. We're going to get a status. And this site here has the list of all of the statuses and the possible messages, of course. It's the, it's the documentation of it. Updating it, and it goes on to an example of how you might update it, and this is, okay, great, you updated it, and now it's version 2 of the data with its own unique string there. Getting, putting, and so forth. So we're not going to look at all of this, we're actually going to do it, but that's the basic concepts. Using, ver uh, using JavaScript to create this, and just using JavaScript syntax, and, um, and uh, creating databases and such. Yes? So because it creates a new version, could you see the previous one? I believe so. I believe somewhere in the documentation it does say that there are the different versions of it still saved. And if we're dealing with, you know, plain old data, uh, you know, you've got those old versions of it that we can that we can get back to. So the downside of that is that if we're saving, let's say, pictures into the database, well, now you've got older versions of the picture still in the database. A more efficient thing would be not to put the actual data of the picture in the database, but a reference to the picture on the memory card in the database. Yes? Is there an upward number of revisions that uh, probably in the technical sense of like a 32-bit unsigned integer of, you know, only like 32 million or something. So there's probably that kind of limit, but practically I would say no. I think there's other limits like um, if you're running it just off of your web browser, the web browsers have some limit 
of the amount of data it can hold, like 100 megabytes of data. For a database, that's huge, because usually we're just text and such. Uh, but depending on the implementation, there is some uh, variance of how much it can save. Uh, we'll look at a couple more things here. Let's go look at API at the top. The guide is a little bit more user friendly to kind of frequently ask, to do a frequently asked question thing under the guide. The API is more of the detailed documentation on how it all works. Um, and, and it's basically the syntax over and over of some database, some method, some arguments with options, with a callback. We're often, like 99% of the time, going to have a callback. Uh, especially in our project. And the callback is simply some function or some extra code to run as a result of doing something. Pull that record out of the database and do something with it with our callback. Or there could be the error result or the positive result. So do something about that error, do something about the positive result. function error result uh, creating database etc so for example uh, the previous at the top it, it had uh, it had new you have to use pouch DB in that spelling and then the name of the database and perhaps options and here it goes on to say, well, what are all the possible options? Uh, what, what are things that we can do? For example, if we've got a username and password, we usually want a username and password to access our database online. That's a good idea. So it talk, talks about that. Um, there's different kind of flavors of this. We don't, write, we don't quite have to worry about this internally. Our device is just going to handle it. The pouch DB spec is set up that it'll just kind of check what it's on and it'll internally create the type of database because it sort of relies on top of uh, either a web SQL database or an index DB database. This is like really deep level stuff. You don't really need to worry about it, it just works. But if you need to specify this stuff, all the documentation is here notes and examples. It goes on and on. Deleting database. Same thing, db destroy it with options if we'd like. Pretty straightforward. Now I'm going to show you here. A lot of the times in the documentation here, uh, on some versions of the code, notice it says callbacks promises async functions. If you put it on callbacks, for example, under destroy, okay, it looks like that. Under promises, it looks very similar, just slightly different. And then async function is another thing. These are three different ways to accomplish the same thing. The, the big difference is, well, what's the way that you know how to handle this first? How do you know how to write JavaScript? Um, we've usually been using callbacks in this class. And I might not have explicitly named it that, but that's what we've been doing. So usually our examples are going to rely on the callbacks idiom. All three of these do the same thing with different amounts of code, but it just depends on how you learn this stuff. Honestly, myself, I would like to find some time, and I guess spring break would have been a good idea, but I was doing other things, to get a little bit more familiar and, and a solid understanding of how promises work. That's becoming more and more of a way that people work with JavaScript, especially with complex, more complex stuff like this. So we're usually going to be using callbacks version of the code. All three do the same thing, just the way we write it is different. And again, uh, maybe for your, you know, I recommend, and I'm going to recommend myself and follow my own advice sometime, I want to also get good on dealing with promises. I recommend you look into it and educate yourself. Yes? When you destroy the local database when it sinks, does it also destroy it online? Not by default. I believe you then have to still do a result here because, for example, we're trying to destroy it. There could be an error in destroying it or a positive response. If there's a positive response, maybe also do uh, the replication to the database online to delete it online. 
because technically this would only destroy it locally. Or if we had specified the the online version of it, it would only do that. With that positive result, then delete the the other one. Um, so all of the all of this is our documentation. We're we're going to do this in, in just a moment, but this is our concept. We're using PouchDB to create a database for our particular project. All the documentation is here, and uh, it's a very cool ongoing project that I that I like, and I've incorporated in my other apps. And um, let's do it. But any questions so far? All right. So the way we'll do this is from the network folder. Remember, I had in there. If you didn't get it already, I have pouch db one start in the network folder. Go ahead and grab a copy of that. I'm going to put that on my flash drive. I'll put a copy of my work there at the end of the day. But go ahead and take that uh, folder and then and then we'll start a, a project with it. We're going to focus on just getting our wrapping our heads around pouch and then we'll incorporate that into our app. I don't want to wrestle with what our whole app is at the moment yet. I just want to focus on pouch. And what we're going to do with that, when we're done with it, we'll just put it into our project. So I'm going to copy this to my flash drive. And if you look in the folder, all that I've given you are the two JavaScript libraries that we need for the moment. jQuery, so that we can write less, do more and the PouchDB library so that we can do all of that new database, put document, get document, all of that. What we need here then is uh, an HTML file. So once again we'll create a very basic HTML file to work with. I'm going to uh, open up Notepad, go to your start menu, we'll open up Notepad++. plus plus. File new. In Notepad++, we'll save as and go ahead and save it to your folder where those files are at. Uh, remember, uh, this all needs to be together. You don't want to simply save this Notepad file over to your desktop. You want to save it to where your PouchDB files are at. And I guess we'll just call it pouch practice dot html. So let's save this pouch html file in the same folder as our two JavaScript libraries. We'll create the quick 10 lines of an html file, then we'll add the JavaScript declarations. So we'll do this again about creating our quick HTML file. Yep, I could have saved us some time by giving you this already, but you're probably rusty, because honestly, how many of you kept coding over summer break? So you want to set that up as we've done before. So just a quick 10 lines like that, and then we're going to add the, the JavaScript at the bottom. the order of this when you get to it eventually of the JavaScript we want to add jQuery first and then PouchDB. We almost always want to add jQuery first because oftentimes many other 
JavaScript libraries rely on it. So if we add, for example, the pouch JavaScript library first and then jQuery mobile, sometimes the commands don't quite work. Good point. That was a test. Yeah, there was something I didn't get there. <laughs> it's April Fool's, but I'm early. I'm, I'm early for April Fool's. <laughs> uh, so, let's see here. Source jQuery dash two dot two dot one dot min dot js. And then Pouch db dash five dot three dot one dot min dot js. So let's take a moment to do that. So came in a little bit late. Remember, uh, we need the add code to uh, enroll in the class. Please. Make sure you get that before you leave. And then also everyone got the sign-in sheet. Did anyone use the sign-in sheet? All right, so our concept is, for our app, we've got this unofficial uh, app for the, for the college. And the concept is that I want people to have like a record of the classes they've taken or that they want to take. I want people to be able to, you know, keep track of that, have their own sort of schedule that they can program, that they can save into their app. So on the surface, it'll just be an easy thing that students have the app, they go to a screen of my classes, and then they save class information. I want to be able to save, so just for notes here, don't write this, but I want to be able to save the CRN uh, of the class, the, um, the name of the class, and the instructor of the class. We can save any amount of data, like notes and all of that, too really other other stuff anything we want we can save anything about the class uh, for the moment I want to save those three pieces of data one class is going to be defined by those three pieces of data and as we saw through pouch DB well we, we need a unique ID field to differentiate the classes um, instructor would not be a good ID to use there because one instructor can teach multiple classes so that wouldn't work the name of the class. There might be a class that does conflict. There might be more than one WordPress class, so that wouldn't be unique. What is unique is the CRN. Every time I give you this, uh, these, uh, these, these ad codes here, there's a CRN number that is unique. Only one class on the whole campus, on, on the whole catalog, has that CRN. So that's what's going to be our, our unique ID field. So when we get to it, this eventually will be our underscore ID. And we can name these things everything else we want, you know, class name, instructor name, whatever. So this human readable piece of data internally will be saved with a unique uh, with a unique name, uh, a field in a database. And this collection of three items, these three fields in the database is one document one document is this whole class and then that document will get saved to the database retrieved from it to display it retrieved to edit it retrieved to delete it whatever so we're going to need some user input we're going to need for people to be able to input these these fields here it can, and again, many of these things that we are doing can be done in such a variety of ways, but here's, of course, one way. We're going to create a form. 
We have an HTML, a plain old HTML construct, a tag, form. Uh, it's probably been around like since HTML 1.0 or something, 1.5. It's really old. And it's a way to, to gather user input. It's one very basic way to gather user input. Uh, it will ask us to type something in and, and then we'll, um, we'll display it. Or we'll do something with it. We're going to give this an ID so that we can reference it in the JavaScript. Just call it class form. Actually, let's call it form class again. Doesn't matter, but we'll call it form class just so that we are kind of consistent. Haven't we been naming IDs and such with BTN, whatever, div, whatever, h1, whatever? We've kind of been naming what the general object is first, and then after that, the specific one. So just any unique identifier. This could be called kittens, and it'll work. We then need some input fields. Um, Let's write first here uh, label. This is the label field. I'll explain that in a moment. And then label, um, we're going to call this CRN. I did put the space there. And then we'll write input. And that's a single self closing tag there. The label tag opens and closes, but then the input is single. What this is, the label is the human visible portion of our form. The word CRN will appear on screen and then a little box for the person to type the CRN of the class. We need to associate this label with this input field. So we're going to say this label is for that input field. And we're going to call that input field CRN field. And this input then needs a name of CRN field. This is how we associate the two. And we'll also, just to, again, be able to deal with it via JavaScript, give it some identifier. And I'm going to use the same one, CRN field. So if I highlight one, it should highlight all three, just to make sure I've spelled it all correctly. We've got a label. This is the text visible on screen. And it's used for the CRN field, input field, which is right here. There's its name. They're, you know, linked together. And then this ID is for our JavaScript to be able to capture whatever person puts in there and do various things with it. And then I also want to say, well, I can have many kinds of input fields, so I need to define a type here. It's back up to before the name and the ID. We'll do type equals text. We're going to capture text here. Um, I suppose we should you could use the type of number, but don't worry about it just yet. And for the moment, let's save it and run it. Let's see if we're on the right track here. Let's see how that looks. It's still very incomplete, of course, but I want to make sure we don't have any weird code problems at this point. So we're going to go up to run. We'll do Firefox. And I'm going to open my console just in case. So if it worked, we just have some text there in an input field, nothing else. And at the moment, we can put anything we want here. You know, we'll, we'll deal with good input and such later. But uh, here's what we got so far. Is that working for everyone? Anyone need a little help? I'm going to put my code back up here. This is what we've got so far. It doesn't quite fit on screen, but not that so far.
All right, so we're going to create a few more fields like this to get a few more user input. Um, next line, this is line 11. Um, let's just save a little time here. Copy line 10 and paste it to 11 two more times because we want three input fields in total. And what we're going to need to change are these unique identifiers and the text that appears there. So, we're, as I said, we're going to ask for the CRN. We're also going to ask for class name. We're going to ask for instructor. CRN field, name field, or uh, class field, instructor field. class field and I'll just put INST instructor field and I need to change those also in my input just like I had CRM field here and on the name and the ID, make sure you change also for class field and inst field, change them both names and IDs for those two lines. Just copy and paste that.
instead of typing the whole thing again, I'm using the same sort of structure, labels, but these change. They're all going to be input types, uh, inputs of type text. They need unique IDs. On the next line, <clears throat> here we need our, you know, our submit button, or clear buttons and such. So this one uh, is going to be another input. This is type button value add class. Or Say save class. Our uh, needs an ID so we can reference it via JavaScript. We'll do but btn add class. Yeah, value is what's going to display on screen. The button itself is going to say save class. That's, that's the human readable part. Oftentimes when someone is filling out a form and they want to kind of start over, they want to clear the fields, so I'm going to add another button. input type, but there's a built-in button uh, called reset. This is going to be an, in, this is going to be a button of type reset that resets all those fields. If we had, you know, 20 fields to fill in, like a DMV form or something, and we want to start over, we can click reset and they all restart. They all clear out. You can do it a variety of ways, but here will be a button to re reset the fields. Uh, of the value again, this is what displays on the button, so I'm just going to say here uh, reset. We're not really going to do much via this, is a very simple button, so it is, I'm not going to add an ID to it. We're not really going to reference it in, in JavaScript. It just does what it does. You click it, it resets. Save it and run it. At the moment, you should have at least those three fields. Type something in, press submit, nothing will really happen. Uh, type something in, click reset. We should clear it out. But at this point, we should have starting to build up this form where we will take the user input. And this user input eventually then will get saved into the database. And we'll do stuff with the database. Let's see, so on mine, it's kind of jumbled up. It doesn't look exactly as I want. If Well, if I'm stretched out like this, it's fine. But if I'm like this, it might not look just fine. We'll deal with design later. I just want to set up functionality at the moment. But I've got these three fields. If I type something in one and click Reset, it, you know, it clears these fields out. This is basic HTML stuff. And if I add stuff here, nothing happens. If I click Save, this has not been programmed yet. Here's where we're at so far, and I'm just taking a quick look in my console also, just in case anything is weird there. That's what we've got so far. Anyone need some help at this point? So again, our concept is we're going to have the user save these three pieces of data. These three pieces of data define one document. That document will get saved to the database. Eventually, the person will save this stuff and I want to retrieve it. I want to display it on screen. The person will want to say, for example, show me my classes. Let's make a button so that when the person launches the app, the person will say, okay, show me my classes. And it'll pull up the classes that they've saved. So let's make one more button. Uh, 
There's another input. Type button. Value. Show classes. And ID. This one we will reference it. Um, so it's btn uh, show class. <coughs> add class show class. Maybe add class get class, but we'll do show class. And I want to display this on screen, obviously. I want to show this uh, to people on screen. So let's create a placeholder on screen to then be populated with the content that we retrieve. So after the form, be careful here, I'm going to go after the form, which in my case will be line 17. I'm going to create a placeholder. We've done this a little bit. Placeholders. A div. Just a plain old div as a placeholder, but it needs an ID so that we can uh, populate it. ID equals div um, results. Later, uh, we're going to display the classes and other things here also, like if we get any error messages and such to show people and such, so it's I'm just calling it generically results. I could have called it div classes, but it's going to display more than that, so that's what I'm calling it. And what I want to do at this point uh, to see if any of this works, I'm, we're going to write our JavaScript inline. We're going to write it just in this file to keep it all together. When we put it over on our main project, obviously we'll, we'll separate the JavaScript into the codica.ext.js file eventually, but I just want to keep it in this one file to keep it all nice and compact. Uh, so we're going to write our own custom JavaScript code here. Let's create a script section after the jQuery library, after the patch library, so that this stuff loads and is accessible to us, and then we can write our own custom code. And I want to do it, I want for the moment to, uh, to be able to type something there and display it in the result, at least to see if we're on the right track, <coughs> if we're able to take user input and display it on screen. So what we'll be doing here is we want to reference the the text that's in the um, in that field. So um, we're going to say that once that button gets clicked, display the text on screen. So. Um, just for temporary. Let's create a variable. I uh, will say uh, my test. We'll just, uh, it'll be empty for the moment. And what I want is that uh, when you click the button that uh, save class, I want it to take what's in the field and display it on screen. So we're going to do Uh, the jQuery of uh, what's the name of the button on screen? BTN. It's a it's an ID. BTN. Add class. Dot on. Remember this. Click. Function. Uh, so then we're going to, um, once we click on this, 
button. Let's go into then. I want the value. Wait a minute, I'm getting a little ahead here. Um, I want to get the text out of that input box. Okay, let, let me just do it like this actually, just to just to do it quickly. Uh, let me let's comment that out for the moment. Let's comment out that uh, line 22. Let's back up to the var at the top, and we'll do it like this: document dot get element by id. Okay, wait a minute. Sorry, I've got my notes here and I'm mixing myself up. Okay. Actually, let's take a quick break. I just need to double I just need to double check my notes here cuz I've got my notes in there. Just a little quick break. Um, at the moment, we should at least have that it that it has this, right? We're gonna make it do something correct in just a moment. Let's take a quick break. It's seven eighteen. We'll take a ten minute break, and we'll be back in ten minutes.